Hello, this is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we are studying the Psalms, Psalm 8. But before we get started, as always, we need to make sure that we have confessed our sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and opportunity we have to study your word. We ask that our minds and hearts will be open to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 8 is categorized as a descriptive praise psalm. Uh, it's a praise psalm and then under the, uh, or we might say a subcategory of praise psalms, it is a descriptive praise psalm. I'll explain that. In this psalm we see both praise and a description of the nature of God. The nature of God will be expressed through references to natural creation, things in the heavens, things on the earth, both man and animals. This psalm reminds us that God is the creator of everything. And in doing so, it raises a very interesting question about mankind, of which we will answer. Well, let's begin. The inscription. That is the first two lines. <clears throat> For the director of music, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of David. Now remember that actually in the Hebrew, this first line is the first verse in the Hebrew. But English translators, for the most part, all put this as a inscription or subheading under the uh, title of Psalm 8, but it's actually in the Hebrew text. So this is part of the sacred word of God, not something that modern editors wrote in. The director of music, this would be the person who conducted the choir in the tabernacle or the temple. You may recall David appointed singers, musicians, as part of the worship services <clears throat> so this would go to the director of music some something that he would use for the temple chorus according to the giddeth now this is a puzzling word i will show it to you giddeth it has to do with the music or the style or it could be an instrument we don't know the word, however, is related to the term for wine press, so it could refer to a certain uh, melody or rhythm that they sang during festivals where wine was involved. It is a psalm of David telling us that David is the author. Verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Here we see an expression of praise. The verse goes on to say, let me put both parts together. I separated, for a reason. I separated them for a reason. You who reveal your splendor upon the heavens. So the first verse should be broken into two parts. The first two lines are actually identical to the last two lines in verse 9. This is called a refrain, meaning that it's repeated at the end of the psalm. You can look at it as bookends. It's technically called an inclusion. And within these two lines on both ends of the psalm, we have the Lord described in terms of creation. So the focus of the psalm is upon the Lord for praise. Notice in parentheses, 
I put the transliteration of the Hebrew to show you the differences between these two terms. The first, Lord, in capital letters, is the personal name, the proper name of God. And later Judaism, this sacred name was not spoken. But rather they would use the second term, some form of, of Adon. Adonai, Adonai, something they would say, they would say this name in place of actually saying Yahweh, or however it was pronounced. We don't really know. We don't have the original vowel pointing, meaning we don't have the vowels. Now, the word Lord, with just the first letter capitalized, means master, owner, lord, as we translate it, or ruler. It speaks of kingship also. So keep those terms in mind. It's a way of saying, O Lord, our king, our master, our owner. Then we have the phrase, how majestic. The word adir, A-D-D-I-R, means mighty or magnificent. It's used to describe the mighty seas or a mighty king or prominent people in scripture. And then we see the term name. How majestic is your name? A word we see often. And as we should know by now, the word Shem, and used in this kind of context, though it is the name of something or someone, when it comes to the name of God, it has to do with his reputation. We do use it in a similar way today when we say we make a name for yourself, you make a reputation for yourself. So that's the idea behind this also. How majestic is your name, your reputation, who you are? And then it says, in all the earth. In all the earth. The next line says, you who reveal your splendor. Let's talk about reveal first of all. Natan. Basically that word is used for give or put or even set. It has a broader meaning as we see in this context that could mean display or reveal. Display or reveal. So we translate it you reveal your splendor. The word for splendor, we see some words here that are quite close together in meaning. Also means, the word is hod. It means majesty, glory, or splendor. Now, you see the parallel here, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You reveal your splendor upon the heavens. So God reveals himself. His name is revealed. His splendor is known from what we see in the heavens. So let's just summarize what we've learned from verse 1. The psalmist acknowledges that Yahweh is our ruler and king. The extended application of that to each and every one of us is that God is our ruler, our king. His splendor and majesty is known in the earth and the heavens. It's manifested magnificently throughout his creation. And don't miss the fact that his glory, his splendor, is revealed in his creation. This is one of those psalms that tells us, in an indirect way, that God does reveal himself to mankind. We can see it in creation. In verse 2, we bring in the human race, in the form of children. From the mouths of children and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. 
Well, let's talk about some of the words of this confusing verse before we interpret it. The word established, the PL perfect of Yasad, it means to establish or found. The PL is a, gives a sense of an intensiveness. You really do establish a stronghold. And that word for stronghold, you might like this word, Oz. Oz, we could pronounce it O's, probably the more accurate pronunciation, O's. But it looks like Oz, you see. It means strength, stronghold, might. Now some of your translations <clears throat> translate this word praise. I think that's inaccurate. I will show you why later. They're doing an interpretive translation there, and I think even the interpretation is wrong. Now, this is a difficult verse in both its translation and interpretation. Sometimes when we come across a difficult verse, it means we have to dig a little deeper. And I spent considerable time trying to sort this one out, looking at some of the technical writings on it. But we learn things from our deeper studies, and that's what we're going to do here. Here is my understanding of this verse. Let me put it back up there as I explain it. <clears throat> There's a contrast here between the children and the babies with the enemies, which are the foe and the avenger. So you see a contrast there between those two groups. Then notice also it's the children who are making sounds, but yet it's the enemies who are silenced. So there's another contrast. So what does this mean? In keeping with what we saw in verse 1, talking about the splendor of the Lord, how it's manifest throughout the earth and heavens, we could say the universe. Here we have children or babies making sounds. Now some interpret these sounds as praise, but that's really an imposition from a New Testament passage. I wouldn't go that far. Now we'll see where that came from later. But my interpretation of what this originally meant when it was first written, it is saying that these children, these babies, these smallest of creatures of the human race, as weak and as innocent as they are, we hear them, their little voices, the baby nursing, we hear the suckling sounds, those sounds are like a stronghold against the enemies and avengers. In other words, it shows the strength of God's creation and that just the sounds of babies can put to silence the enemies or the avengers of God or God's people. It's a reminder that God is the creator. He controls his creation. So, just as we see the stars in the heavens, or a beautiful mountain, or river, or lake, we are reminded of our creator, his power, his majesty, his splendor, even displayed in small children, whose sounds silence the enemies and avengers of God. Now, where to get through some of the interpreters, or I should say translations, and let's keep this in mind, any translation of the scripture includes interpretation. Simply because that's the way it has to be done. Because unless you understand what it's saying, you can't know what it's saying. So you can't translate it. So that is a big issue. 
Don't forget that. All translations are interpretations, depending on the people or the individual who translated it. Well, Jesus used some of this psalm to make a point with the chief priests and scribes. There was a setting in which the children were singing a chorus about Jesus. Matthew 21, 15. Matthew 21, 15. And we'll look at 16 also. But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they ask? Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you, Lord, have called forth your praise? So there we have Jesus quoting in part this psalm, putting it in a different setting, and actually reinterpreting what it means in his particular context. Now, this is a little difficult uh, to understand, but this is a principle of biblical interpretation. This is one of the more advanced principles. It has to do with studies of Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament. But here's the principle. In the New Testament, there are times when Jesus, or a writer of scripture, will take an Old Testament passage, quote it in part, sometimes more full than others, use it in a different setting, and broaden or give it another meaning. They could do this with the Spirit's guidance. So, that's what's going on here. Now, as you can see the word praise, that is the word in the Greek. And this is where some translators will take the New Testament meaning and impose it back on the Old Testament psalm. Now, what is the truth here? What we do not want to do is take the meaning and put it on the original meaning. Then you don't have the original meaning. However, depending on the passage and the context, sometimes the New Testament may clarify what the Old Testament message was saying or leading up to. And this is a delicate point of interpretation. So this is a good example of the principle I just cited. There are times when Jesus, or writer of Scripture, will take an Old Testament passage, use it in a different setting, and give it a different meaning. But clearly, the thing we see in common is that the children are speaking and expressing something on behalf of God. That is the common truth we see between what Jesus said and what the psalm said except what they said is different. In the Old Testament passage, they were just making sounds that silenced the enemies. Here, Jesus, and if you notice, they were actually saying praise. You don't have that in Psalm 8. They were just making noises. So there you have a clear difference in the passage in the particular incident that happened in Jesus's interpretation. So in Jesus's interpretation we even have the words of praise. From children we move to a continuation of the nature of God, a description by looking to the heavens. Verse 3, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have established. Let's look at some of the words. I consider. Now, this word and the Cal imperfect, 
ra'ah, it actually means to look, <clears throat> to see, to see. But it also, if you look at something long enough and study it, you learn from your looking, or you perceive. Here the writer is saying, when I consider the heavens, then he says, the work of your fingers, God's design, you see. And then he mentions it. The moon and the stars, which you have established. The word for established is the polel perfect of kun. It means to establish, to be firm or set. Now this is leading up to something. There are two areas of rule. These two areas of rule are the heavens and the earth. The first here is the heavens, mentioned as being ruled by the celestial bodies like the moons and the stars. We learned that from Genesis 1. Just a reminder, let's look at 1, 16 through 18 quickly. And God made two great lights, the greater light for dominion over the day and the lesser light for the dominion over the night and the stars also. Notice the word dominion. And God placed them in the firmament of the heavens to be light upon the earth and to rule the day and night and to separate between the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There's other references to this in Job 36, 29, 38, 33, Isaiah 40, 26. So what we have here in our psalm, when the psalmist ponders the heavens, and the creation of the stars and the moon. And he sees them dominate the heavens. How they move about during the day and the night and project their light. Both over the night and the day. It's also a way in which we tell the time and the seasons, the months and the years. After observing space, <clears throat> he states two parallel probing questions. Verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you should pay attention to him? The word for man here, one you don't see used too often, is enosh. It's actually a word used more for mankind. You see it in poetic passages. E-N-O-S-H. It refers to mankind, all human beings. And then the phrase that you take thought. The word for you take thought, zakar. It means remember or call to mind. In other words, you think about him. Why do you even give man a thought? And then in parallel to man, we see the phrase, and the son of man. Now that's a poetic phrase, again referring to mankind. And the son of man, that you should pay attention to him. The word pakad, that means pay attention or observe with interest. Now. He looks up at the space, into space. He sees the stars. He sees creation. He sees the sun. He knows the moon. He knows the vastness to some degree of space. So in contrast to what he sees of God's creation, its heavenly bodies, the wonder that the stars project at night, what is man that God should give him any attention? He's so small. He's such an insignificant creature when it comes to the vastness of what one sees in space. The thousands of starlights. How much they knew about space in those days regarding planets and distance isn't an issue but they could see the beauty of creation, the largeness of it. So the psalmist raised the question, 
Why does God even care about man? Now in our day, we know there are billions of human creatures upon this small planet and this seemingly endless universe of creation. So even with what we know today, we can ask the same question. And the question doesn't end there because attached to that, verse 5, and make him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and majesty. Let's look at a couple of these words closely. And make him a little less. It is the PL, the intensive again, of Kasser. It looks like chaser, but it's pronounced Kasser. To decrease, to lower. All right? So it has the idea of man being made lower or decreased compared to God. Now let's talk about the word for God. As you may know, the word for God is Elohim. It's in the plural. When it refers to God, the proper name of God, our God, the Creator, we translate it in the singular. Though technically it is actually a plural form. And the same word is used for gods in the plural in a pagan setting or when we're talking about the gods of the pagans. And of course this context has to do with the proper uh, name of God as we translate it, God. Now the question is should this word Elohim be translated and interpreted there you see interpretation comes into the passage as God, God's, or as some understand it, as angels. As God's, in the plural, small g, it would refer to the pagan gods, which were often backed by demons. But this doesn't make sense. Why would we be talking about pagan gods in a passage like this? Because actually, we know they really don't exist. Only, a sen only in the sense that behind them are demons, but that's not what the god part really refers to. It refers to the pagan gods, what they worship, their statues, their whatever they uh, worship in the form of what they call some sort of being regarding nature or some power in nature, whether it be the ocean or the wind or the sun, whatever that may be. So you don't see the translation gods anywhere because no one really interprets that. Now some use it, use the term for angels. That's not a term for angels, but I'll show you what happened as we saw what happened in our earlier passage where they take something from the New Testament and interpret it, or impose it, I should say, upon the Old Testament. So, as God, it makes the most sense, though it may be a little harder to understand. But as we move through the psalm, it will become more clear what it means that he's made a little less than God. Well, to add to that concept is the next phrase. I'll just put the phrase up here. And crowned him with glory and majesty. Now, those two terms are used for what one does with a king, a ruler. The word for crown, the pale and perfect of atar. 
Now that word and the imperfect means that it's a continued action. Though we translate it as already done or accomplished with the word crown, the idea is in the imperfect that he continues to be crowned with glory and majesty. Now, it really doesn't make sense to say you are crowning him. Because when we crown someone, we basically put the crown on their head and it's done. So we have to do the best we can, and that's why I explain it, as the imperfect indicates a continued action. Man continues to receive, he continually has the rightful place as ruler. Don't miss that. That's important, as we will see later. So man is made less than God, and he's also crowned with glory and majesty. In other words, man is viewed as the constant, well, in the constant status as a ruler. As I said, these are words for a king. The next verse explains, verse 6. You make him rule over the works of your hands. You have put everything under his feet. You make him to rule the hifel imperfect, the causative stem. That means that God has caused man to rule. The subject, you, causes the action. It's imperfect. The action continues. God has made man the continuous ruler over the work of his hands. The word for rule, Mashel, it means to exercise dominion or to rule. And of course, the work of his hands, or the work of your hands, refers to creation. And then we have another phrase similar in meaning. You have put everything under his feet, under man's feet. The word for put, the perfect tense, meaning the action is complete. All right? The word is shith. It means to put or set. Now with those meanings in mind, let's look at the verse again. Verse 6, you made, a little trouble getting it up, you made him ruler over the works of your hands, you have put everything under his feet. So in combination with the previous verse, man has been crowned. He has majesty, he has glory, he has honor. He is ruler over God's creation. Put under his feet. Now this is in Psalm 8. This is reflecting what we know of man at creation. God originally gave man dominion over the earth. And it's in his creation. He was assigned as, let me put the term up there. This is probably the best term to use if you can keep this one in mind. A vice regent. In other words, he rules in God's place over the earth. This is what we call the dominion of man. You'll see that in a lot of Christian circles. God gave man dominion over the earth, authority. And its creation, the animals. Genesis 1.28 And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. And rule 
over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that crawls upon the earth. So man was given dominion over the earth and its creation. Now, let's understand this point. Mankind was given the right to rule over earth and creation by God. Verse 7 and 8 tells us that includes the animals. Now look at those together. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes through the paths or currents of the sea. Now all the creatures that pass through the currents of the seas, like the largest whales to the tiniest sea creature, this last phrase, passing through the currents, probably refers to things like, well, if you're familiar with the migration of whales. They go way up north, then they come down south, depending on the season. They migrate. Man is to rule the creatures and creation, not to be controlled by the creatures or creation. We don't live for animals. We don't live for creation. Some people have that turned around. Now, this gives significance to man. This answers the psalmist's own questions back in verse 4. What is man? Man's significance is in the fact that he rules planet earth for God. Mankind is on earth in God's place as ruler. God has put creature man over his creation. In that sense, he is made a little lower than God and is made, as we know, in the image of God. So God gave man the capacity. He gave him the rulership and he gave him significance. Man is a very important part of creation. Now I know the phrase that man is made a little less. Well, let's look at it this way. When we consider less, let's think in terms of perhaps we should be more uh, relative than what we might first instinctively think that means. A little less means just barely under. Not really. Because when you're under God at all, it's a long ways. So, when it comes to earth, though, in the context of man's rulership over earth, God has given man this high position when it comes in relation to the earth. Well, Perhaps we should just ponder that. Man is given rulership over a significant and important part of creation. And that is centered on planet Earth. Planet Earth, in that sense, is the center of the universe. Alright? Now, let's close the psalm and then we'll do some discussion here. We close with two lines of praise that we begin with. Here we go. Verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's summarize what we see this psalmist, this psalmist did in the verse. 
He began by praising the Lord Yahweh, our God, the personal ruler, our personal ruler, who also rules, who created, I should say, the heavens and the earth. Even small infants tell of him to the point of silencing all enemies. But then when man considers the heavens, their vastness, their design, the Lord's finger work, we might say, the thought arises, what is the significance of man? The answer is in the fact that God has crowned man as ruler over his creation. His human creature over all creatures. So that man is exercising God's rule as his vice regent over God's creation. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 5 and following. One of the places where this verse is quoted. Let's go there. Speaking of mankind. Hebrews 2 5. Is, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. Don't miss that point. Angels don't get to rule over the earth. Now you can see where some interpreters want to take the term angels and impose it back in the Old Testament over the word for God. Verse 6. But there is a place where someone has testified. Of course, we know that's in Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with honor and glory. And notice how the word angels has replaced the word for God in the New Testament. Quote. So here's another example of where a writer of scripture takes an Old Testament passage and reinterprets it to some degree to point out the additional fact that man was also made lower than angels. And he's crowned with glory and honor. Attributes often given to God. In the original Psalm 8 interpretation, man is said to be lower than God, a little lower than God. Now you can see where some would be more comfortable in putting the term angels in the Old Testament, but that's not the word for angels. It's the word for God, or gods, if you want to be have another alternative. Now, verse 8 of Hebrews, chapter 2. And putting everything under his feet, again, that's along with what we saw in verse 8. And then it's an explanation. Explama explanation. And putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. Now this should begin to clear things up for us. On the one hand, God gave mankind the position of rulership over creation. Nothing was left out in original creation. But then we have this line, yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. Well, let's look at some explanation. First, going back to the beginning of this passage, verse 5, angels did not get this privileged position as vice regents over earth, over God's creation. 
Then we see the writer draw on Psalm 8, makes mention of what is man that God is mindful of him. He raises the question, the son of man that you care for him. Then we begin to get a broader question. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. Now we begin to get some answers. And then it talks about God left nothing that is not subject to him. And then we have this phrase that kind of explains everything. Let me put it on the board again. Let me put the whole verse up there. Last line. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. Well, since the creation of man and the original creation, and since man was put in charge of everything, things are messed up. Sin, the fall of man, the curse on the ground, that is particularly one that I feel, especially when I go to work, that makes life so hard, the devil, his cosmos diabolicus that he's imposed upon the world. That has made it nearly, and I should say, impossible for man to really rule as he should. I mean, mankind's having difficult time just surviving sometimes. It's not a Garden of Eden anymore. And that demonstrates the kind of damage that sin and the devil has done. So now we understand the phrase, yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. It's been really subverted by both the devil and his system and our own sin, our own sin nature, our tendency to sin whether it be our greed or misuse of God's resources or misuse of the earth, our abuse of the animal kingdom, even though uh, the Noahic covenant back in Genesis 9, where, no Moses, or where Noah is told to go out and repopulate the earth again, and uh, the implication is that mankind is still ruler, just as this Psalm 8 tells us, man is still ruler. In fact, in Genesis 9, we're told we can eat animals. And that's pretty dominating. So the question is, when does subjection of the earth to mankind, when does that get fulfilled? Or will it? Well, verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 2 begins to answer it. Now, the passage goes into another subject, but it begins to answer who will place it in subjection. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. See, that puts him on par with humanity. Now crowned with glory and honor. And he could be crowned because he suffered death. So by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And then the passage goes on to explain some other things. That's really not pertinent to our study. But what we want to see here is that Jesus, who became man, he actually became the God. He was God. He became man making him a, crea a creature. So as the God-man, notice, made lower than angels, just like man was mentioned earlier, crowned with glory and honor, he is now king. Now notice how the writer uses the name Jesus. That's the name of, the, of Jesus. He says humanity. 
Jesus is his human name, emphasizing his humanity. And notice also how he's crowned with glory and honor. But then let me ask you, where is Jesus now? He is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavens. He is ruling. He rules with some, now listen to this, some limited degree over everything. How do we, why do I say limited degree? Because he has not placed everything entirely under his feet. That will come. Now, if you studied Psalm 110 lately, this should remind you of the first verse of Psalm 110. Psalm 110, 1, in utterance of the Lord to my Lord, set on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now our verse in Hebrews 2.9 said that he had to suffer death, first the cross, then the crown. In the meantime, Christ is subjecting everything under his feet. This process will continue up to and including his millennial rule. When we enter the final phases of everything coming under subjection and then ultimately fulfilled in the new heavens and earth where the administration of such will be under both the Father and the Son. In other words, well that particular passage is in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. The Father is not subject to the Son, obviously. But in the, in, the, in the administration of the new heavens and new earth, the Father and Son are together in ruling the new heavens and new earth. So what does this come down to? Mankind originally appointed as ruler over God's creation earth that will ultimately and completely be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for this marvelous psalm. We thank you for your word, and we see how things tie together in a great way as your new covenant scriptures reveal to us some of the deeper things that we learn that are first begun in the Psalms and extended to our day. Lord, we look forward to that time when our Savior will return and set up His rule so we can even share in that rule and appreciate the capacity that You've given us to rule with him over creation and its creatures. We thank you and we praise you for your goodness and grace, your mercy and your love, your majesty and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.